Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Offshore windmills are wind turbines installed in the ocean or large lakes, becoming increasingly popular as a source of renewable energy. One of the challenges of installing offshore windmills is transporting and placing the towers weighing over 1,000 tons. Solutions like McGregor's Calibri Crane work as self-piling cranes mounted on a jack-up vessel, having several advantages over traditional methods of transporting and installing offshore wind turbine towers. The Kid Cardine Offshore Wind Farm is a 50 megawatt floating offshore wind farm located approximately nine miles off the coast of Aberdeenshire, Scotland. It is the largest floating offshore wind farm in the world and the first to use wind turbines of more than nine megawatt capacity. The project uses five Vestas V164 9.5 megawatt turbines and one V82 megawatt turbine, each installed on wind float semi-submersible platforms designed by Principal Power. Its construction began in 2018, and the first turbine was installed in 2020 being fully operational in 2021 and generating enough electricity to power nearly 35,000 homes. The installation required a floater, which is the semi-submersible platform that supports the wind turbine. This was towed to the quay side in Dundee, where the wind turbine was assembled in a controlled and efficient process, thanks to the wind float technology. The installation vessel placed the four anchors offshore, which were used to hook up the mooring system and electrical cable, completing the windmill system. Similar projects include the Highwind Skyland Pilot Farm, which is the world's first commercial floating wind farm located 18 miles off the coast of Peterhead, Scotland, with a total capacity of 30 megawatts. Such a farm consists of five six megawatt Siemens direct drive turbines on high wind floating monopiles. The high wind concept was developed by Statoil, now Equiner, and is the first commercially viable floating wind turbine technology. Its installation was a complex and challenging undertaking. Still, it was ultimately successful by building the substructures in several European facilities, assembling them in Norway, and attaching them to the Scottish seabed using suction anchors. Well, this is a, a pilot park with five turbines. The next step is, of course, to, to go bigger and into new areas. And it is also well worth uh, pointing out that we have a technology qualification program, which is very important part of Hive in Scotland, uh, which will feed in research data into future projects. Service jack-up vessels are specialized ships used to install and maintain offshore wind turbines. They are self-elevating vessels, meaning they can raise themselves above the waterline using their legs, allowing them to work in water depths of up to 490 feet. Fred Olson Wind Carrier is one of the world's leading providers of JIVs, including the Brave Turn, a state-of-the-art vessel capable of installing the largest and most powerful wind turbines currently available. It has a heavy lift crane to lower and install the foundation structure.
This may involve drilling into the seabed or using gravity anchors. Lifting and securing the wind turbine tower onto the foundation using specialized bolting and welding techniques. The manufacturing process for wind turbines is a complex and multifaceted undertaking involving various steps, from the initial design and engineering to the final assembly and testing. The tower, which supports the wind turbine blades and nacelle, is typically made of steel. GE's Pensacola facility uses a state-of-the-art tower manufacturing process that involves robotic welding and automated cutting machines. The nacelle houses the generator and other critical components assembled from various sub-assemblies. Usually, it has a dedicated assembly line that uses precision tools and techniques to ensure the accuracy and reliability of the nacelle. GE uses a resin infusion process to manufacture the wind turbine blades. This process is less labor-intensive than traditional blade manufacturing methods, and it produces blades that are lighter and stronger. GE's Pensacola facility has a dedicated testing area where the wind turbines are subjected to simulated wind loads of up to 150 miles per hour. The wind turbines are also subjected to various electrical tests to ensure that they function correctly. It's an honor to lead a team of approximately 600 employees across three shifts, turning out machine heads, hubs, and drivetrains of differing model types. Fran Hoffer, IWES, has developed new methods for the production of rotor blades for wind turbines. These methods are designed to reduce the cost and manufacturing time of rotor blades, including the development of a new machine concept that can meet the demands of both production and further processing. The Blade Maker Demonstration Center is a new facility that will be used to test and demonstrate the new rotor blade production methods. The rotor blade shell is made of glass fiber. It is manufactured using a process called vacuum infusion, impregnating the glass fibers with resin and then applying a vacuum to draw the resin into the fibers. Once the shell is cured, a prefabricated belt is loaded onto the shell, which serves as the backbone of the rotor blade and provides structural support. The rotor blade is packed up in a vacuum foil, and a vacuum is applied, soaking the space between the fibers and liquid resin. After curing the resin, a special two-component glue is applied to the bridge, which is a component that connects the shell to the backbone. Finally, the component is hardened and shape verified, obtaining the final product. Floating wind farms are a type of offshore wind farm that utilizes floating structures to support wind turbines in deep waters. Unlike fixed bottom offshore wind turbines, which are anchored directly to the seabed. Floating wind turbines are anchored to the seabed using mooring lines and are kept afloat by buoyancy chambers. Electrical cables connect the wind turbines to a substation on the floating structure or onshore. From there, the electricity is transmitted to the grid.
unlike wind turbine fields that just run autonomously, oil production platforms are small cities that must be manned 24 hours a day to function. Production sites vary from shallow to deep, but generally, the deepest are designed with the capability to operate in over 9,000 feet of depth. Oil rigs are self-sufficient. They generate their own electricity and purify their own water. Each day, drillers operate the rig to produce thousands of barrels of petroleum products. The oil is then exported to shore via a network of hydrocarbon pipelines or oil tankers. In the middle of the hectic and harsh conditions, the platforms provide workers with dedicated recreational spaces. From cinema, billiards, and video games, to musical instruments, every crew member can choose their genre and nurture their talents during off-duty hours. Additionally, the crew recharges their energy with nourishing meals and good discussions around the table. The food is prepared on board and served fresh by specialized cooks. Crispy pork, rice, eggs, and vegetables, all the necessary ingredients for the weekly schedule are available. The crew on oil rigs often work 21 days, followed by 21 days off, or two weeks, followed by three weeks off, depending on company policy. This rotation helps manage the physical and mental strain of working in such an isolated and challenging environment. Going to work on oil rigs is as special as working on them. The crew arrives at work by helicopter or supply ships. The transportation mode depends on the distance from the shore. Helicopters are preferred for relatively close distances, while supply ships are more suitable for farther sites. Upon arrival, newcomers undergo safety briefings and introduction to familiarize themselves with the rig layout. They will work and live here until the next crew rotation time comes. A typical work day on an oil rig is long, usually comprising 12-hour shifts, which can be either day or night shifts. Crew members work seven days a week during their rotation period, with little distinction between weekdays and weekends. Every shift begins with a briefing meeting, during which the incoming crew is updated on the rig's status any production issues, and safety protocols. These meetings are crucial for ensuring everyone is aware of their tasks and any potential hazards. Once briefed, crew members head to their respective stations. The crew monitors drilling activities in the control room. From these advanced systems, they have absolute control over both topside facilities and subsea wells. They can open and close the valves remotely to control the amount of extracted oil. They are also responsible for multiple other indicators. If anything goes wrong in one of them, it might affect the whole system. Fortunately, production engineers are there to troubleshoot any potential issues.
Their job goes beyond corrective solutions to preventative maintenance. Sometimes, unexpected events might arise, pushing the limits of engineers to come up with immediate and creative solutions. Oil rigs are extremely complex in their engineering, as they must endure the unforgiving environment of offshore conditions. The design process of these platforms can be even longer than the construction itself. The evolving business landscape, especially the new regulations regarding sustainability, poses many challenges for oil rig builders. As the world pushes toward cleaner energy solutions, offshore platforms, whether powering wind turbines or pumping oil, remain marvels of engineering and endurance. From the advanced cranes that install floating wind farms in deep waters, to the self-sustaining oil rigs that operate like cities at sea, each structure represents humanity's determination to harness natural resources in the harshest environments. Whether it's generating electricity for thousands of homes or extracting vital fuel reserves, these platforms reflect a blend of innovation, resilience, and skilled manpower that keeps both the global grid and economy running. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.